Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, now that I'm in shot, my name is Dr. Richard Ford. Richard is fine. The only time the doctor is useful is, you know, if I'm trying somehow to impress someone, which doesn't happen very often. Right, so <laughs> I want to say, first of all, welcome to Force Point. Thank you all for coming on this kind of rainy Austin day. Still getting used to the weather here in Austin as I'm a relatively new transplant, having moved here to become chief scientist for Force Point. Um, and I've been sort of getting used to this sort of awesome Austin vibe for about almost, almost two years, but it still feels new and awesome. I want to talk to you today about where we are and where we're going before I let some other fine folks in the room sort of jump in and sort of get to the specifics. So I'm going to give you the high level kind of stuff of, of where we are. And I want to start with, you know, a fairly non-controversial statement. That's where we are today. Right? And I say this as the chief scientist of a large security company. And we are indeed a large security <laughs> company. So our natural sort of competitors, you know, are the semantics, the fire eyes, the Palo Altos, the world. You know, we sort of play in the same sort of spaces. We've got firewalls, we do secure web gateways, we do all the kind of things you'd expect. So hopefully it's refreshingly honest to start your sort of day here with security has failed, right? Does anybody think it hasn't? Do any of you really feel like, you know, we get a sort of A plus for security as a sort of group of people? <laughs> I'd say no. Thank you, no. I've never had anybody say yes, actually, which is always. I'm always not sure we get a D plus. I don't even know if we get a Z plus. <laughs> exactly, um, and I, I have to say that uh, I, I would concur. We have lost the plot as an industry and as a group of computer users. The devices you have on the desk in front of you are the most complicated devices known to man, right? And yet we think that we can sort of bend them to our will, do anything we want on them, and somehow do it safely. I would put it to you that security has failed. What do I mean by that? I mean traditional security. So what's computer security all about? What we've tended to focus on is, you know, we can get all science-y. I mean, I, I, I'm lucky I've got the word science, scientist in my title, right? It always makes me feel sort of science-y. I should have an equation somewhere on this slide. Um, I made this slide myself, by the way. I just wanted to <laughs> point that out. And well, yet and still, Sarah, who's sitting in the back room, edited it because she said it was too central where I had it. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Security has always been traditionally about telling the bad from the good, right? So think about antivirus. We all are pretty comfortable with the concept of antivirus, and the myth of antivirus is that we can take some binary object that's coming towards my computer, look at it, and know with certainty whether it's good, oh yeah, let this thing in, that's fine, or whether it's bad. Oh, this is, you know, a nasty piece of malware, it's wanna cry, it's patchy, I'm gonna stop it. And unfortunately, that's a sort of half truth. It's actually, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that we know are bad, there's a whole bunch of things that we know are good, and there's this, all this sort of gooshy stuff in the middle that's a little bit more difficult to tell. And so how do we deal with that? How we deal with that is you draw an arbitrary line on the floor and it's one size fits all, and we go, oh, you know, if it's to the left of this line, it's good, if it's to the right of the line, it's bad. And we're always on the back foot as defenders. Because because our world is about deciding good from bad, it's like playing rock, paper, scissors, and you know you always have to go uh, first. I'll play that game with any of you, any time. I mean, I come from the offensive side of the house. I've done a lot of work on offensive security as well as defensive, and I can tell you it's a lot easier in many cases to play offense than it is to play defense. The world we live in today is a tough, place to be because we have this paradigm of inside and out, doesn't exist anymore, right? The traditional perimeters have eroded, they've sort of dissolved, they've kind of gone away. And we have this paradigm of something's either good or an event is either good or an event is bad. And in fact, mostly what happens is that events lack context. So if you take a threat-centric view of the world, what I mean by that is this, this view of the world where you try and say, this binary is bad, this binary is good. The problem is that you spend your life on the hamster wheel of pain, which is what most of my CISO friends describe as, as their day job, right? 
And so by doing that, you're always reacting. You're never done. But there are some constants in the mix that we can come back to that sort of work a little bit better. And again, we're going to spend kind of the rest of your afternoon talking about that. Um, some of those constants are really where the data actually gets accessed. Remember that security is a means to an end. There's not an end in and of itself. You're typically trying to protect a data or you're trying to protect a person. Security is the means to an end to sort of enabling that. And again, when you make it about the threat, you're always on that back foot trying to keep up. So I want to talk about something that's really, where is your data most useful? It's when it's accessed, right? It's when, <clears throat> when is it most vulnerable? Many times it's when it's accessed, right? So even if you use encryption at rest and you know, you've got all this sort of identity goodness around it, it's that point where it's in the clear, where it's most useful and most vulnerable. And so what you can do is instead of taking it in a vacuum and trying to decide beforehand if, if a stream of events are good or bad, let's look at the actual interactions people have with the data because it's super important. If you can truly understand where the data and the person come together, then you have a chance at getting off that reactive back foot. I mean, you can take a behavioral example to ransomware, right? So it's a very rare day that um, David, who we'll be hearing from later, comes in, clicks on a link on a web browser, and encrypts every document on his hard drive. That's not normal behavior for David, thank God. But it is kind of normal behavior for <laughs> ransomware, right? If we take a threat-based view of ransomware, what we have to decide is, is the binary that he's downloading or the PDF file that he's downloading or the flash file that he's downloading bad. Instead, if we take a behavioral approach, we can say, what's the value of the data that David's looking at? How many files has he just encrypted? And there's a lot of ways to tell um, if a file's being encrypted. Shannon Entropy being one of my favorites. Again, you have to throw those things in to earn that chief scientist mantra. Shannon Entropy really is about the information content or the compressibility of a file. And the other thing is then that when you take this approach, you stop focusing about, again, if you, if you step back and think about it, security in many ways is about things crossing a line. And when something crosses a control point, we decide if it's good or bad. And when you start thinking about it, that's a really difficult world for us to create because those control points are harder and harder to find because we've gone out to the cloud. And the cloud's awesome. Right? I can do my work so much more quickly because of the cloud. I'm very cloud first, cloud centric, now I think about the world. Big fans, again, coming back to David, you'll be talking a little bit about clouds, I think, at, at some point today. So, so when we think about the cloud, just think about this. Back in the old regulated days of security, if I wanted to go get a server, what happens? I would walk up to the second floor and I'd talk to the fine, um, guys and gals who, who run our help desk, and I'd say, hey, friends, because you know, I, always, I always go with chocolate, actually, when I'm trying to get stuff out of the IT uh, team, works very well. But hey, friends, I need a server. What's going to happen? They're going to stand up a box. They can configure it to the way they want it. They're going to put it in the server room. They're going to give it an internal IP address. It's going to be behind a firewall, and we're off to the races. Those days have passed. Those days are well gone in the security space. Now, I whip out my trusty corporate credit card, um, and I get onto my cloud provider of choice. I stand up a bunch of infrastructure. I copy a bunch of super confidential data up in there. And I don't see what could possibly go wrong with this scenario, right? And <laughs> IT has no visibility or control. So again, if you follow the data, you're in a much, much better place. This is the only Gartnery slide that I, that I sort of have on here. And it's a little bit hard to see in the, uh, in the backdrop that we have. But basically, it talks about the sort of move that we've had from threat centricity, so think about the old AV days, to a sort of evolved view of looking at security. So as the world sort of matured, we started with antivirus. Right, it's the, the absolute sort of poster child for sorting things into good and bad piles. In fact, I spent a large portion of my youth sort of sorting large collections of binary files into bad and good. Um, firewalls, what do firewalls do essentially? The heritage of the firewall, it was about allowing one thing to connect to another or not. 
wasn't very interested in the content, was interested in the connection. If you think about Marcus Raynham's early firewalls, right? They go back to the sort of really early days of cyber. Then the secure web gateway, where did that come from? Well, first of all, it didn't even have the word secure in front of it when it was first sort of, sort of brought into, the, uh, in, into light. It was all about web filtering. It's like, oh, there's this thing called the web and there's stuff on the web that, you know, I maybe don't want my employees to see or there's stuff on the web that, you know, I want to see what they're doing so I can make certain they're being productive, which by the way is the world's worst way of necessarily just looking at sort of productivity. It's much more nuanced than that. So, but it was about what comes into the organization. Again, it was the idea of this sort of line that you step across. As the world started to evolve, we started to discover that it wasn't just about the lines. It wasn't about what connects to what. It was about what's moving over those lines. And so we started to move to look at the other vectors into the company. If I was going to infect your company or a company, you know, that if I, was, if I had somebody in my crosshairs, probably the first thing I'd do is I'd send a few emails. If I was really bored, I'd actually call them because the phone is a deadly, deadly weapon that is hugely undervalued. And you get the person who's already inside to do something for you. And that gets to this whole what's inside versus you know who's really inside and has access to your systems. Next generation firewalls, what do they do? Yes, they stop things from connecting from A to B. But they do it by also looking at the content. So we've moved from the connection to the next level up, the content. When we look at email, it's not about you know what's, what does this email link to? What's the context around it? So as we start to move up the value chain, the security effectiveness goes up, but we're getting more and more focused on content. Next, we come to my favorite three letters in the, in the security arsenal, which is DLP. I think DLP is a, pro, is a, is a technology of data loss prevention, data loss protection, depending on you know, where you grew up, right? It's a technology that we massively underutilize as defenders, because what DLP does is it says, hey, Richard, you can't send this um, document marked force point confidential to a Gmail address, potentially, if that's how you configure it, right? You get to choose what content you allow out of your organization. And it can be very powerful because how many of you have had the experience of, you know, you type in um, three letters of an email address and it auto-completes and you don't read it quickly enough, and it's auto-completed to the wrong person, it wasn't who you were thinking, you don't notice, you hit send. What's even worse, and I've done this myself, oh, I forgot, it's being recorded, oh well. So now the world knows, I've done this myself, <laughs> is here's a great way it goes wrong. I have a few of my colleagues in, in my email with their personal address and their corporate address, and I see the name and it says, Jim Birmingham, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm okay to send this document. No, I just sent it to his personal address, right? It's not a bad thing, I trust Jim, but it's not a good way to control my data because, you know, I don't necessarily know how well he's taking control of that account versus his corporate account. In all these ways, we can accidentally put our data in jeopardy. Let's move to the top of the scale, the almost invisible UEBA, or user and entity behavior analysis. That's honestly, I promise you, that's what it says. UBA starts to add analytics around this, right? So the problem right now is we've got a whole lot of signal and we have to figure out what's interesting in that signal. So when I look at our log files, I've been called in to do breach remediation in prior lives. I have never looked at a breach where I couldn't find the fingerprints all over the log file, the footprints. It's like somebody walked across a really snowy field. Bad analogy, I get it in Austin, um, but you get what I mean, right? You leave tracks. The problem, and if you were looking, you could have found the tracks. The problem is there's so much in those log files, it's hard to pull out what's interesting. It's only afterwards that you go, oh, that was interesting, I should have seen it. What UBA does is it allows us to start prioritizing. It's a, you can think of it as a cognitive prosthesis, if you like. It doesn't think for me, helps me think better. I get a prioritized list of things, and I can now look at them in some sort of priority order. It starts to pull that signal out from the noise. It's very powerful technology. We'll be hearing about that, I think, next. As we focus more and more on this, we focus more on, we've gone from this arc, threat-centric to data-centric to almost risk-adaptive where the system starts to respond to the environment that's, that it's in. 
That's the story that we want to sort of chat about today, because it's an interesting story, and it's a different story from this traditional view of security that thinks about bad to good. It's behavioral. And right there, I want to stop and say, you know, let's talk very briefly before I hand this over to Jim about privacy. Because when I start talking about beh behavior, you should immediately think about privacy, right? Doing this right involves thinking and baking privacy in from step one. Right? It's the thing that people don't talk about often, but they should. Because guess what? This technology isn't just technology we develop. It's technology that I use on myself. I care about my privacy quite a lot. Thank you very much. And so baking privacy into behavior so that we can protect the identity of the person is very important. It runs, it's a golden thread that runs through everything we do. Every time we look at, look at a topic, we look at the privacy implications that it has, how you can use those behaviors for protection, right? To uplift, to raise up the person that we're, that we're busy protecting as you get more and more into that content. So that's the high level sort of view of where we're at. And with that, you know, we can pull it together to sort of knit these products together. The other thing that we need to think about in security is it's not point solutions all over the place. Because the problem with point solutions, and I'll tell you this as somebody who's attacked a lot of systems in my life, <laughs> is there are discontinuities in that protection. So you have one set of rules of product A, one set of rules of product B, and there's this tiny gap in between. And the nice thing about attackers is they're very, very, very capable of adapting. They'll find that gap and they'll slip something through that piece of paper. 